Lord, everybody. Would you stand and worship the Lord with us tonight as we sing? How many of you are glad to be in the house of God tonight?
screen tonight. We remember Carolyn Rogers having back pain. In a minute, she uh, needs to find the truth and she needs to be able to get sober. Also, Mike Combs is having health problems. Brianna Williams having back problems. Cynthia and Lloyd Page um, having injuries and complicated by diabetes. We need to continue to remember uh, Rose Brown for healing and Pastor Mickey Lewis having heart issues. Ashley Johnson, who's still recovering from that gunshot wound, and Kathy Gloss, who's on hospice, Kathy Williamson, who has cancer, Tim Workman's wife passed away, needs the Lord peace in his life right now, I'm sure, and uh, Janie Parrott's dad has passed away, and um, also Dottie Wallace and the Reasons family need our prayers tonight, and we need to continue to remember our community uh, in your personal community tonight. Jesus. And if nobody else has anything they want to mention, we're going to go ahead and take these needs before God right now. Let's go ahead and go with him. Lord, we praise you. Thank you. We can come to you, God, and we can bring every need to your feet, Lord, that you care about every single need, Lord, no matter what it is. You know the ends and the outs of every need and every life tonight. God, I pray for your healing virtue in this place tonight and to follow these people's bodies, God, who need your healing touch. There are so many, God. In Jesus' name, we worship you tonight, God. I pray, God, that you give peace to those people who are suffering loss right now. Give them strength, God, in the name of Jesus. I pray right now, God, that you would just allow Hannah right now, God, to fill your spirit, God. I pray that you would help her to have revelations of truth, God, that you would help her, Lord, to be able to have the strength to take that it takes to get sober and the courage, God, to do it for herself. In Jesus' name, I pray right now for that part, God, that Brother Mark is waiting on for this trial. Lord, I know, God, that you know all about it. You know where it's at, Lord. And I pray right now that you would just help that to come in quickly, God, so that he can get back to work. Lord, you know every day that you're a provider.
God. And right now, I pray that each one of you are lifted up by the word that you're going to hear tonight. And at this time, we're going to go ahead and dismiss into our classes. What a beautiful atmosphere tonight in the house of the Lord. Amen. Do you like what you feel in this place? Amen. I know we're in a moment of transition here, but I just still feel such a sweet presence of God. Amen. In this room. Would you just lift your hands and just love him one more time? God, we worship you. We exalt you, Lord Jesus. You alone are worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. We bless your name. We honor your name, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what we feel in this place. Amen. Dottie walked up to me before service, and she said, Pastor, uh, I want to tell you about something that happened to me on Sunday. She said, when I was praying, I had a real good feeling. And she said, my legs started shaking. Amen. And I said, well, you know what that was, don't you? I said, you were feeling the presence of God. Yes, she yes, said, I know yes. it was the it was the Lord's Spirit. Yes. It's such a blessing to see God moving in people's lives. And, amen, amen. you know, we take for granted um, those of you who have been raised in church, and especially if you've been raised in a Pentecostal church, uh, we often take for granted just being able to feel the freedom and the liberty of the spirit that's here every service we may have different church but we don't ever have bad church right, right. it's just it's just whatever the lord wants for that day and where his spirit is there's liberty i remember uh in the first maybe two or three years that we had started the church here we got our first group of kids together to go to a youth convention and uh, we really didn't have a youth group they were just kids in the community we were ministering to and somehow we got a group together that had enough interest that wanted to go to the youth convention. It was in Cape Girardeau that year, so it was close by. And uh, some of these kids had never even been in our actual church service. They'd come on a Saturday night for a youth event several times, and, and we were just trying to get our hooks in them any way we could and get them in the presence of God. And at that youth convention on the first night, um, one of the young men that was with us, um, as people began to pray and began to pray with him, um, I realized in his reaction, which to me was a strange reaction to the presence of God, it was partly fear, it was awe, it was, it was uncomfortable yet desired. And I realized in that moment, this is the first time that he's ever felt the presence of the Lord and knew that God was not just a concept out right. there of good in the universe, but that he's real right. and that he's alive. Aren't you thankful that you serve a living God? Yes. Amen. Yes. We can feel his presence here tonight. Yes. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And Acts chapter 2, verse 46 through 47. Did everyone get a handout tonight that wanted one? I believe we have enough printed up. And if you have an ink pen, great. If you don't, um, Brother Ben, are there any left back there? If anybody would need one, has everybody got one? No, pens. Okay. But there might be some in the door. If anybody needs anybody need an ink pen? Or everybody good? All right. Um, went back in the sound booth after church the last Sunday that I preached. And... I saw that my uh, notes for the slides, you know, the scriptures that I had given to the sound man back there, I noticed that they'd been made into a real nice paper airplane. <laughs> <laughs> and I assumed that Brother Ryan was just trying to entertain uh, Finn back there or something to keep him settled. Um, but, you know, sometimes we give you these handouts, and I don't know. I see them laying on the seat. They don't have anything filled out on them. Um, 
but at least you didn't make a paper airplane, right? Yeah. Amen. So, well, if that, if that will keep you quiet and keep you engaged, then go right ahead um, as we get into the Word of the Lord tonight. But these two scriptures we'll read at the, at the beginning are uh, scriptures that have really been a part of the overview of these lessons. And we are actually on the last lesson, believe it or not. Now, it may take me two or three weeks to teach it. Who knows? But we are on... Uh, the last lesson of this daily discipleship series. And we've learned as we've studied these discipleship habits that we see demonstrated in the book of Acts, that if we will do these things consistently, they will prevent us from becoming weak consumer Christians and will transform us into strong followers of Jesus Christ and these biblical steps that build us into disciples they're not dramatic they're not quick fixes um, they don't work if we do them sporadically that's why we call them a habit uh, we have to consistently be involved in these discipleship habits that we've been teaching about in order to reap the benefits but I've been seeing the benefits in the atmosphere of the church yes, yeah. just as we have yes, taken the first um, several months, I guess we're entering into the fifth month now of the year, and we've been spending most of our time, uh, at least on the weeks that I've been teaching, we've been dealing with this series. And so I'm seeing a difference. I'm seeing a difference in myself. And you know what? If we can uh, stop praying for God to change everybody else mm -hmm. right. and just open ourselves up to what God wants for our lives... Let the change begin here, then it will begin yes, to affect uh, someone else. And sure. at some point around midnight, mm -hmm. Paul and Silas said, you know what, it's time for a paradigm shift here. We know how prisoners are supposed to act. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. things are so bad, things are so terrible, and sometimes they are. Right. But one of them just kind of said to the other, you know, what, what's going on here really isn't working, but we know what right. do works. Yeah. Right. And they begin to worship. Mm -hmm. um, they begin to extend themselves. They begin to right. um, call to memory the blessings of God, the word of God that was hid in their heart, the things we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And the result of that was an earthquake that loosed everyone in the prison and resulted in the jailer himself uh, receiving the wonderful message of truth and salvation. And so that's what it's all about. And tonight we're going to be talking about the fifth of these discipleship habits. You see them listed there, and they spell out the acronym. You take the first letters, every, because we want to do these things every single day. Uh, enlist, voice, extend, read. And now we're down to um, something that is so very important, and that is the concept of yielding. And we're going to be talking specifically about yielding our time. Everybody say time. Time. Talent. Talent. And treasure. treasure. Let's look at Acts 2.42. In fact, let's just read that out loud together. Acts 2.42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And that's what makes it work is continuing. Because we never know when there's going to be a first-time guest. Um, Mark and Jenny can tell you that because they have to take care of making sure that there's uh, gift bags. And we started running low on supplies. You know, I noticed we started having a lot more visitors after we started thinking about visitors. Right? You notice that we've been baptizing a lot more people since we've been talking about baptism. Easter message was all That's about it. the power of the name of Jesus and, right. and exalting his name. And since Easter, it's just like we've had a flood of people getting baptized and and tonight will be we have another one sister jenny's getting baptized tonight awesome. and we're so happy uh, for that and so you get what you preach right. and guess what we get what we live yeah. right. 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 and so as the church is living out these discipleship habits it is going to affect our community right as sister jennifer right. says our personal community right. those that are in our sphere of influence and we're seeing it happen and as we look at Acts chapter 2, verse 46 and 47, it says, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Yes. 
and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. He added to the church daily precisely because his people did these things daily. They continued steadfastly in these habits without a break. Somebody say every day. Every, every day. So we've already talked about enlisting in ministry, and that is where you use your gifts and abilities inside the church to grow the church. The church needs to be growing on the inside, too. Not all church growth is having someone new come in, but while we're here, we're supposed to be growing. We're supposed to be developing and maturing in God. And we've talked about extending the reach of the church through evangelism. And that's where you use your gifts and abilities outside the church. And again, what's the purpose? To grow the church. So we want to be using our abilities in here. We want to use our abilities out there. But now today, the message is about yielding your gifts and abilities. Your time, your talent, your treasure to grow the church. And again, as I said, it's all about growing the church. Why is that? Because we know that living things grow and dead things don't grow. And the worst kind of church is a dead church. Because if the church is dead, we're lying on God. Because he's alive. He's not in the tomb. Uh, he's not under uh, the circumstances, but he is a victorious Savior. And so if our church is not growing, then it's misrepresenting God. Now, we shouldn't have a knee-jerk reaction and say, well, uh, our attendance isn't greater than it was at this point, say, last year, although it is. But if that were the case, that doesn't mean that the church is dead. Uh, there could be growth happening um, in our lives here. I know during the pandemic, uh, when we could not do the outreach that we wanted to do and the church had to shift gears, we made a conscientious decision that we're going to take this year and we're going to put down some roots. We're going to put down roots in this youth group. We're going to teach holiness right, right. this year. We're going to teach things that we can't really uh, freely teach in the mixed group when you have uh, new people that are coming in every week. They're not ready for that. Right, right. Uh, and if you disagree with that concept, well, then you disagree with Jesus because the Bible says that when Jesus spoke to the multitudes, he didn't talk to them without a parable. Right. Right. He kept right. it simple. He just kind of threw it yes, out there. Sir. And the ones who were hungry would come to him and say, now, what did you mean by that? Right. 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 And the ones that weren't interested and they just wanted to eat some loaves and fishes, they went on their merry way. Right. Right. Um, and so... Uh, there's growth that happens when we desire the things of God. Yeah, and yeah, so we yeah, saw great advancements uh, in our young people, their depth of spirituality, their grasping of uh, and outward um, holiness and marks of devotion and all those things. Uh, so there was great growth that happened in the church during pandemic whenever sometimes none of us could uh, come to church. Right. Uh, we just had to do a recording, and everybody watched it from home. Uh, but the proof is over time, we, you'll be able to tell if a church is alive and growing or if it's dying out. And this is a growing church. Yes, sir. Um, and it has to do with this concept, this habit of yielding our time, talent, and treasure. And you may think, well, we already covered that. Uh, in these other lessons, but not really, because when we're talking about enlisting and extending, and now we're getting into some slides here, if you see a highlighted word, that's because it goes in a blank there on your handout. So I'm trying to help you out here. We found out over time that as I teach lessons, I'm not very good at saying things the way they are on the page, unless I have it right there, seeing what you're seeing. And after the lesson, everybody would say, now what did you say there? Because as I'm going, I just say it in however I want to say it not the way necessarily that it's in my notes. So this is your guide to help you out. Enlisting and extending are about finding a ministry that you are gifted to do and enjoy doing. All right? That's enlisting and extending. Everybody has gifting. Everybody has things that you enjoy doing because you know you're good at it and, um, and because it's your forte, your area of expertise, uh, it's easy if we can just get you to enlist, if we can get you to get out there in the harvest, there's going to be results. But now yielding is a little bit different. In fact, it's a lot different because yielding is about putting 
your abilities and resources to work in areas that you are not specifically gifted for. There are some things that uh, you can do, but it's not natural for you, okay? Um, and you can develop in areas that you did not previously um, minister in. I know when I was just a, uh, a young teenager, uh, our pastor resigned and left the church there where we were at and at that same time I was I had just received my call to the ministry well actually I had not yet it happened a few months after they left um, but when the pastor resigned uh, his wife came to me uh, the service before they left and she just said uh, Marty there's some things that that God is going to ways that God wants to use you that are not going to be comfortable for you um, even at that age, and Brother Steve would would be able to verify this because he was there at the time, but uh, I was not shy when it came to singing. I could minister. Uh, there was an anointing that was there even at a young age uh, that whenever I sang, you know, it, it was a blessing to the church. Um, and that was kind of my breaking into the feeling the anointing and understanding right. the concept of what it means to minister to others. And so at that time, I was already comfortable in that. But she said, now there's going to be some things that you're not going to be comfortable. But don't reject those things just right. because it's not comfortable. And I never forgot that, and I needed that very quickly because the Lord uh, called me into the ministry. And at that time, my thought was, well, how could I do that? What would I say? I, you know, I probably couldn't be up there for five minutes. Oh, boy, were we all wrong? <laughs> <laughs> with that here I am just barely scratching the surface of these notes and ensuring that this will take a couple of weeks to teach what should be a one week lesson um, but that's the way that it is it's about yielding and if you'll yield guess what God imparts gifts severally as he will that's the King James English not the way we talk but he imparts gifts to those in the church as he will, as the body has need. And I could say, as you have availability, the body has a need, and therefore God is going right. to be able to use you if you will yield. Right. Uh, one thing I've always cherished about this church is um, in the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. Um, from the early days on, I could tell you of situations where people who had never given a message in tongues or had never given an interpretation to a message in tongues. Um, and I'm not criticizing this, but a lot of times in a church, there will be a couple people that operate in that. And once again, if something is operated in often and heavily by the same uh, people, you know, the old joke goes, you know, when we want to have a move of God, we come in and one minister said to another, just in jest, I'll give the tongues if you'll give the interpretation, you know. And just, of course, not doing that, but just saying we really need something to happen um, in this service. But anything like that um, can be open to abuse and misuse, right. um, you know, because it really needs to be truly a gift in operation and not our flesh. And so... Uh, I've always cherished that about this church because I've seen so many times when it was a person who God had never used in that way, but because they yielded, right. and we've always encouraged that, because they yielded, they were able to use them, and it actually uh, gave a higher degree of validity in the minds of the people right. because it wasn't pastor that gave the tongues, or it wasn't right. pastor that gave the interpretation, but it was someone else. and. Right. I can think of probably five or six people that maybe you would think they would never, I don't think I've ever heard them do that, but they have uh, when the Holy Spirit moved upon them and they yielded to him. So that's what the concept of yielding is about. And, you know, why in the world would we do that? Why would we do those things that we're not gifted in yet and we're not comfortable with? This is the reason, okay? And this is not popular teaching, but it's true teaching. It's because that you are a servant who is yielded to God. Right. There are three telltale areas that are accurate indicators of whether or not we are actually serving God. All right? And these are the three areas that we're talking about tonight. Our time, 
our talent, and our treasure will reveal whether or not we really are serving God. Now, we are called to be servants, but Jesus had to illustrate it several times to those disciples who were with him every single day, he heard every uh, lesson he taught. Um, can you imagine just being in that situation where you didn't have to, uh, you didn't have to ask the, the pastor a question and him say, well, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but let me pray about it and I'll get back to you. Because we're human and that's the way that it is. Sometimes I don't know all the answers. And the best thing I can do is not try to make something up. But Jesus never had to make anything up. He never had to say, well, I'll get back to you on that and scratch his head and try to figure it out because he was God incarnate, the living word incarnate. He was the totality, the sum total of God revealed in human flesh. So he was all that stuff. Every verse of scripture was right there in person. Are you following me? Okay. And yet those 12 men had to be constantly reassured, had to be told, you know, this is what the kingdom's about, and that's not what it's about, and the way up is down, and the way down is up, okay? And whoever's going to be greatest among you, uh, be, it, be the servant of all, and go ahead and, and wash his feet, whether you want to or not, because why? Because you're a servant, and being a servant is about yielding, right? Right? So let's talk about these three things that reveal our service to God. What does yielding mean in regard to my time? What does that mean? Well, it means that in a culture where the average person now spends the equivalent of a 40-hour work week on television and Internet every week of their life. Can you believe that? The average person spends a total of 40 hours a week combined in internet and television consumption. And if you don't believe that, then, then go ahead and put one of those things on your phone that tells you how much time you're actually on the internet. You know, I don't consider myself a, an internet junkie or addict. My wife might disagree. But I can tell you this, that when I go on my phone to do something, like to look at work, I have an app on here that tells me is there a doctor dictating right now? What do I have to do tomorrow morning? And I go in and I see my workflow. Okay, right now this is either a good or bad sign, depending on depending on your uh, opinion, whether you want to work or not. Right now there's no work. There's no work to do. But muscle memory, when I pull out my phone and I'm going to go to look at my work, instead my thumb hits Facebook. And then I'm like, well, what did I go to Facebook for? But now I'm already there, and I see, oh, I got a message. I got a message right now. Oh, what are they? Oh, somebody wanting prayer. Well, at least that's productive, you know. And I've got four notifications. So that's how it works, okay? So without even thinking about it, you spend five minutes here, five minutes there. You're in the car going down the road. You're looking at it, right? right. And so I didn't compile the data, but the average person, according to the data, spends 40 hours a week. And we say, I ain't got no time. I ain't got time to do um, nothing. Right? right. Um, well, it's because our culture has us in that trend. But being yielded in the area of our time means we break the trend and we yield our time to God. Right. Now, let me hit you with something here. Allowing for eight hours of sleep every night, which I never get. Um, but I do get a nap here and there throughout the day. So I'm doing all right. But allowing for eight hours of sleep every night, you have approximately 110 hours in a week. Everybody has the same amount of time. All right, 110 hours. So following the simple principle of the tithe, what does tithe mean? Tithe literally means a tenth. Okay? So if we can do any math, we understand a tithe, the very meaning of the word, is a tenth. So if you follow the principle of the tithe, which we usually apply to money, then if we applied that to our time, that would mean 11 hours in our week should belong specifically to God. Well, how would that look? Well, church attendance, prayer and Bible reading, volunteering and ministry. Just following the principle of tithes, you really ought to carve out 11 hours a week. Now, if I can carve out 40 hours for Internet and TV, 
right? right? Then the truth is that 40 hours is disposable time that I could be yielding. Well, yielding means I really don't want to do that, but I'm going to yield. I'm going to give this up for the sake of principle. Well, you can't preach stuff like that, can you? But I believe God is raising up a hardcore, sold-out, no-holds-barred right. group of Christians in the last days who have absolutely no problem giving one quarter of the time that they give to Facebook and TV sitcoms right. to God. Right. Okay? And um, I know that's plain, uh, but if we're going to get the job done, we're going to have to yield our time. The, nobody else is going to do it for us. That's right. Nobody else is going to work for the kingdom of God. Um, I'm talking about for this church. No one else is going to win the loss right. on our behalf. Um, we've got to get out there and do it, so we have to yield. What does yielding mean in regard to my talent? I would say that it means that in our American culture where many Christians are obsessed, just like everyone else, with climbing their particular corporate ladder or advancing in job opportunities, we again break the trend. And that scripture that says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Yeah, that's scripture. And that scripture is about yielding. And Jesus said, don't worry about it. After all these things, the Gentiles seek and they're all consumed with advancement. Okay. But he said, that can't be your priority. Your priority has to be the kingdom of God. That's it. But if you'll make the kingdom of God your priority, God will take care of this other stuff, and you'll still have it. Amen. Wow. Yeah. You know, Solomon, this is in our devotion, I believe, this morning. King Solomon asked the Lord for wisdom. He said, I don't know how to go out, how to come in. I don't know what to say to the people. I don't know how to be a king. And when God said, I'll give you anything that you want. Well, imagine if that... A genie lamp, you know, was at our disposal or that bottle washed up on the shore and we picked it up and the genie popped out right. and said, you get one wish. Oh, my goodness, what would we wish for? Right. That's basically what happened to right. Solomon, right. except it was God that it was, it was a real thing, not a, not a fictitious thing. God literally said, ask whatever that you want. And... What happened when he said, I want wisdom to know how to lead your people? God said, because you did not ask for the things that you really, people would want in their flesh. He said, guess what? I'm going to give you that wisdom, and I'm going to give you the stuff you didn't ask for. Woo! Hallelujah. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. It. shall be added unto you. And I, I tell you what, I stand before you, I am a contented man as far as life in general. I'm not content that I've done enough or that the church has grown to where it needs to be. Or I'm not content and settled on my lees is what I'm saying, but but I'm, I'm content with uh, living for God. Yes. And I'm not worried about whether I get that helicopter. I'm not even worried about if I get that Caribbean cruise because I know... <laughs> That whatever that I need, yes. God is supplying. Yes. And he gives us the desires of our heart. And I believe that that doesn't just mean that God gives you whatever you want. I believe it means that God gives you desires for the right things. And that's where contentment is at. That's where happiness is at. Mm-hmm. Is if you get to a place where you don't desire the things that you don't have no business dealing with. My goodness, if I had that helicopter, then Jamie would be worried about me crashing it. (laughs) She'd be a nervous wreck. Then I'd realize I gotta pay the taxes on the thing. Whoever, you know, gave me the helicopter, but I gotta, gotta pay the taxes. I can't even afford the taxes on a helicopter. I can't even afford the taxes on a new car. And then, yeah, all this, it all comes with a price, you know. Right. So seek first the kingdom of God. Everything will be taken care of. 
you'll have godly desires. Right. And that's where it begins. Man, I just feel like teaching, preaching, that's and just all right. but we don't have time. <laughs> Ten minutes left. What were we talking about? Helicopter. Talking about helicopter. helicopter. We're talking about talent. <laughs> all right. So what we what we naturally do is we use the talent that God has given us right. to succeed in life, you know, to to climb the ladder, to um, you know, to make gain for ourselves. And um, I've done a little songwriting and music recording, and I haven't done a real good job of representing it or getting it out there, or getting record deals, and who knows if that would be possible. Maybe it would have been possible if when I started doing it at the age of 16, I devoted my life and my energy right. to that. Right. And maybe Marty Bryant or whatever fake name I come up with <laughs> that was cooler, right? <laughs> yeah. Maybe that would be a household name. But maybe I would be lost. Right. That's it. And maybe I wouldn't uh, have any happiness. Right. Uh, maybe I would have uh, already exited life early uh, right. because I got off on the wrong on. track. Maybe my family would be broken up. Maybe a lot of things. Come on. Right. But I can tell you this, whether anybody ever knows my name, right. um, the goal is ministry. Right. And right. because of that, I'm happy. Right. Amen. All right, let's move on here. Real Christians refuse to use their expertise with the trades to build bigger and earn more if the house of God is falling into disrepair. Right, come on. Or we're having to postpone necessary projects because there's no volunteers. A real Christian says, no, it's not going to be that way. Maybe I'm not going to make quite as much uh, this week, uh, but I'm going to do something uh, to, to help that situation. Good Real Christians refuse to use their education and strategic, kill on, strategic skills only to earn a paycheck right. Right. while their church languishes for the lack of those same talents. Oh, no. They're going to step in and say, this gift was given to me, so I'm going to right. yield that. It don't mean I'm not going to work a job and, and take care of my family, right. Right. but I'm also going to use, I don't recognize God gave me that ability, right. and I'm going to use it for the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Real Christians refuse to waste their sales skills on pep rallies, sales seminars, and conventions when there's a world going to hell and those very same talents could be used to teach Bible studies and give a powerful witness. Right. If that's my job, i got to go out there and sell. But if God gave me the ability to sell, what greater thing to sell than right. something that's free so and something that's eternal? Amen, amen. Man, could you convince people of that? You'd be doing something right. great. So that's yielding our talent. What does yielding mean in regard to my treasure? It means that in a culture where there's a selfish attitude of me first that sits on the throne of every human heart and where the constant song of materialism is simply entitled more and the words go like this, more, 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 more. Thank you, play that one. You probably could. We could write it right now. Right. That's the song on your list. It's just simply more. Right. We need more. And then when you get more, are you happy? No. No. Because the happiness comes in the yielding of yourself That's to your it. creator to be used of him. I truly believe that. Yes, sir. So we break that trend when we yield our treasure to God. The Bible says that you cannot serve God and money. The Bible says that where your money is, your heart automatically follows. So that means you must put your treasure into God's kingdom. And really, in the grand scheme of things, God doesn't actually ask for much. What does God ask for? He asks for tithes. We already know what that is. That's a tenth. And offerings. Real Christians have absolutely no problem giving 10% of their increase back to God. That's a tithe that belongs to uh, to return to him, to say, thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Right. And they have no problem with that. And I would, I would go a step further and say that real Christians have no problem giving offerings above that. Why? Because we understand that God makes the rest go further. Right. And that is a fact. Right. Right. If 
you've never tried that, God says, prove me in this. Put me to the test. And I'll show you how I can bless you. So it's not about money, but what it is about is about yielding. And I've said many times, God doesn't need your money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Somebody said he owns the potatoes under the hill. He doesn't need your money. If he wanted your money, he could take it all. You know, just ask Job. And Job was a very giving, generous, honorable person, but... Uh, but he lost all of the, you can lose it all with one cancer diagnosis. You can lose it all uh, with just one tragic moment in life. Um, You can lose everything that you've worked for. And uh, there's people here, including myself, that we've faced that, and we know personally that there are things that can happen beyond your control, that the things that you consider important uh, really are no longer important at all. But if you're yielding to God, David said, I've never seen this. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. And I've never seen his seed out begging for bread. Right. Amen. God's faithful. He's going to prove himself if we yield our lives to him. Uh, in your notes there, someone read for me Matthew 6, 24. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll just call on you. Has everybody got it in their notes where you can see it? Matthew six twenty four, Brother Mark, can you read that? Is it not in there? Is it on the back page? No? Matthew six twenty four. Well, I'll tell you what, just read it off the screen there. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and All right. Uh, Sister Jenny, read Matthew six twenty one. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Yes, sir. All right, uh, that's kind of small. Who can see it? Who has good eyes? Sister Rebecca, can you? Rebecca, can you read? Okay, Malachi three eight through ten. Read that for us. Hallelujah. I mean, that is a promise of the word. And this room is full of people who have lived that promise. And you understand that through tithing and offerings, that that yielding process brings about a comfort. It does for me anyway, because this is the way I believe it. If you don't do it, Guess what? You're on your own. (laughs) Financially, you're on your own, for better or for worse. But the minute that you return that tithe to the Lord and you say, Lord, I I didn't get this because I'm great. Whatever abilities that I have, you gave them to me. Thank you for my job. Thank you for the ability to earn a living and to take care of my family. You're just returning and saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. you deserve the glory. You deserve the honor. You deserve what is due to you. Yes, amen. And then the other is just a free will thing. Just as the Lord prospers you and blesses you, and there's a missionary or there's, a, uh, uh, there's something going on in the church, a building fund or whatever, you just say, Lord, I just want to bless your kingdom. Yes. And it's not any kind of required amount. It's just whatever is in your heart and within your ability to do. But as we give cheerfully, as we yield our treasure to the Lord, guess what? He said, where your heart is, your treasure is going to be. And we're laying up treasure in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so whether or not you have much in this life, if you've been consistent and faithful in yielding your treasure to God, then yes, he's going to bless you here. But the real blessing is, in eternity. Amen. And I'm looking forward uh, to that. Somebody said the 
pay's not that great, but the retirement's out of this world. Yes. Amen. But it really is true. Maybe sometimes you feel like you're getting the short end of the stick, but um, it's all going to pay off in the end. And so he tells us to prove him that he will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I believe this church has been blessed and got to the point that we are. We do not uh, basically drill people for money. We don't uh, talk a lot about uh, giving in, in each and every service. Usually when we talk about giving, it's something that's going to go outside of the church uh, other than the building fund. We don't pass the plate, uh, and that's different from what a lot of people are used to. But we teach that we are to bring our offering to the Lord. And in the uh, New Testament, and I don't care how other people do it, uh, we just we had eight people. We just kind of got tired of passing the plate every service and knowing that we're going to give whenever we get paid again. But just to follow the custom that we got to pass around, and everybody got to come up with a dollar to put in the plate. That's not how the church is going to be supported, right? So uh, we can teach giving, and the way that uh, I decided to teach that here was that when Jesus talked about that woman that put in her, her two mites or whatever it was and said she gave more than anybody, the Bible says that he stood over against the treasury. Well, the treasury was a fixed location at the temple or the synagogue where people brought their gifts, and they dropped them in. And they did that of their own free will, of their own accord. And they just understood when we come to, to the house of God, we're going to stop by and put our gift in the treasury. Right. And so I thought, well, you know what? That could work. And I had somebody ask me about that recently, another pastor. He said, we've been thinking about doing that. He said, well, we're just kind of worried that if you don't, you know, put attention on it, that people may not give consistently. I said, it's never hurt us right. whatsoever. And uh, began to tell him how the Lord had blessed, and and so I don't know if they did it or not. But uh, the truth is, givers are going to give, and givers are going to be blessed. And we don't just give to be blessed, but we give because we understand the importance of yielding to the Lord, and that whatever we give to Him, the Bible says that He is able to keep that which we have committed to Him against that day. And so whatever it is uh, that we give to the Lord, we can trust him with it. And I think what I was trying to say is that we, um, I've always said that uh, God doesn't need your money, uh, but you need God to have charge of your money. You see what I'm saying? You, you need God to be first because it's going to be, it's going to help you. It's going to keep you out of trouble and it's going to keep you in a place of blessing instead of living under a curse. Amen. Well, I run out of time. It's 8.03. I always give myself a few extra minutes, but it's time to, to go on. So next, next lesson, we'll talk about earnestly contending for the faith. That's something else that God wants us to do, and that'll be the conclusion of this lesson. I'm very confident that we'll get through this in one more lesson. And if you believe that, say amen. 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 All right. Well, I'm glad you feel that way. Let's stand together. And we're going to be dismissed in prayer, but then we're going to have a baptism. So uh, if you want to stay for that, we're going to just have a few minute break here while my Sister Jenny gets prepared. And then we're going to celebrate with her as she takes this great step of faith uh, to affirm uh, what God has been doing in her life. Yes. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this night. We thank you for this group of people and for all that you're doing. And we know, God, that as we continue to yield to you that you're going to continue to bless. Lord, we know, God, that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So let your power just flow through us, through our lives as we yield our time, our talent, our treasure to you, God. You're going to use it for the glory of your kingdom. I think we ought to just praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you, God. Hallelujah to your name. Oh, hallelujah to your name. We love you, Lord. Help us, God, to be yielded servants to you. And be consistent in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We're going to have the baptism here in a few moments. And if you need to leave, that's fine. If not, then we want you to stay and celebrate with us. Amen.